So, as we all know, a mere three months ago, we were treated to the first ever reveal of Metroid Prime 4. It was confirmed to be called Metroid Prime 4 Beyond. We saw gameplay. We saw Samus. We saw Silux. It was freaking incredible. This was a game-changing, dare I say, life-changing moment, at least for myself, to finally be able to freaking see Metroid Prime 4 in the flesh as a real game, a tangible product, something that we know Nintendo and Retro Studios will be finishing and delivering to us sometime in the future. Man, what a time to be alive. I am so excited. And of course, now that the reveal of the game is officially behind us, the reveal of the Switch 2 is somewhere in front of us. It's now a period of the waiting game. We are now waiting for the next update and information about Metroid Prime 4 Beyond. We want the release date. We want to know which platforms we might be able to play it on. We want to know more about the story. We want to see more gameplay. We want to see more locations. Maybe get some teases about new upgrades or weapons or abilities that we might not have ever seen before. How does Silux really fit into the story of this game, and how is there even a fourth Metroid Prime to begin with? There is so much to dive into and to look forward to. You guys know me. I wake up every day waiting for that next piece of information, both to get me excited as a fan and to have a reason or an excuse to make a video about it for you guys. So, since we still have no new information about Metroid Prime 4 Beyond, what I want to do today is kind of go back and revisit what I think is the true golden age of Metroid. And I want to cover the 2000s and go over all of the incredible Metroid experiences that Nintendo was delivering to us in that decade. By the way, just a reminder for a lot of you guys, I've been doing this YouTube thing for over 10 years now. And something I would love to do, maybe before the end of the year, maybe in the early parts of 2025, would be to finally cross that 30,000 subscriber threshold. So, if you like what I'm doing, you're not subscribed, you've never been subscribed, be awesome and consider subscribing to the channel. So I have talked about this before on videos, and I've also made a lot of tweets about this, especially after the reveal of Metroid Dread back in 2021. It was a great time, of course, to start revisiting Metroid and talking about its past and its lineage. And I used that as an excuse at the time to remind some folks of the glory days of the 2000s for the Metroid franchise. And now I want to do it here in this video. So here's what's really wild. When you go back to the decade of the 2000s, and if we include 2010, so I'm going to kind of add that in because you could argue that we're only looking at 2000 to 2009. I'm going to look at it as 2000 to 2010. Okay, a little bit of a cheat because we get to squeeze one extra game in there. There was a total of nine Metroid releases in the 2000s. It is obscene what Nintendo was doing for the franchise at the time. We got the birth of the 3D Metroid series. We got the continuation of the 2D Metroid series. We got the first ever third person 3D Metroid game. We even got remakes and collections of Metroid games. It's something almost totally unheard of for any franchise if you really think about it, except for maybe Mario. I think across the entire gaming spectrum, whether you're talking about Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, or any other company, I think outside of Mario, which gets tons of releases and spin-offs every decade, I think the decade of the 2000s, specific to Metroid, might be the most prolific era of any one franchise ever. Again, outside of Mario. It is crazy. So to celebrate and reminisce about this wonderful era, let's quickly run through all nine of these amazing Metroid releases that occurred in the 2000s. So what's great about this for me is in 2002, the first year to visit, my favorite video game of all time is what we get to start with, which is Metroid Prime, released on the GameCube in 2002. I was working for GameStop at the time. I was like a third key manager. My manager actually went to the GameStop conference that they used to hold for managers, where they got tons of free stuff from all the different companies, Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, and others. Sometimes they would get free consoles. I think my manager actually was given a free Xbox, which was a new hot item at the time, again, in 2002. And one of the other things she got was a voucher for a free copy of the upcoming Metroid Prime for the GameCube, 
And while I wasn't the diehard Metroid fan I am today, I was still a big Metroid fan and one of the biggest Nintendo fans working in our store at the time. And so she gave me that free copy of Metroid Prime on release day that she was owed and said, here you go, this is for you, Rob. And of course, playing that game changed my life. I don't need to go into it any further. A lot of you guys already know this about me. All I will say is it was an amazing, like mind-blowing experience for me to play that for the first time in 2002. I was 22 years old, living with a couple of roommates at the time, playing that game alone in my bedroom on my free time. And in the following year, I realized it was a game I couldn't stop thinking about. I went back and revisited, and I realized this is the best game I've ever played. And what's really crazy is on top of that, the exact same day in 2002, also saw the release of Metroid Fusion on the Game Boy Advance, which was also a game that I purchased and played at that exact same time. So it was a double dose of Metroid. Two Metroid games on the same day, you guys. The first ever first-person 3D Metroid game with Prime, which went on to be the best-reviewed game in the entire Metroid franchise, as well as the continuation of the 2D franchise, Metroid 4, called Metroid Fusion, releasing on the very hot and popular Game Boy Advance. And this was a monumental release. Many people consider it to be one of, if not the best, Metroid game. And it introduced a great new mechanic with the SAX and the X-Parasite, the idea of the fusion suit that Samus was wearing. It very much came off like a bit of a horror experience, and it was so fun and exciting to play a new Metroid 2D game that was a direct successor to Super Metroid, basically a new, you could say, a new 16-bit 2D Metroid game. It was like we got a new 3D game on the GameCube and we got a new sequel to Super Metroid on the Game Boy Advance. A phenomenal experience. What a day for Metroid fans. Skipping ahead two years to 2004, it's another double dose year of Metroid because there were two releases for Metroid in 2004 as well. We'll start with Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, which of course was the GameCube sequel to Metroid Prime. This is an excellent game, and in my opinion, underrated. Even though it did review very well and had a lot of attention at the time, it's a game that I think not a lot of people give as much credit. Metroid Primes 1 and 3 seem to dominate a lot of the conversation. Metroid Prime 2, for some reason, gets left out of the conversation quite often, and I think that's a shame because it's amazing. I was also fortunate enough to attend E3 in 2004, and I got to play that game at E3 before anyone else had played it. So I already knew it was a better looking, more exciting game than Metroid Prime was initially, even though I think Prime turned out to be the better game. Echoes, easily the hardest game in the entire franchise, the longest game, very complicated. It's put together like a huge puzzle. The hardest bosses in the entire franchise, in my opinion, as well. But it introduced Dark Samus. It took the story and the gameplay to a new level. Some people don't like the dark and light ammo mechanic, and I understand that. I, however, do enjoy it for what it is in that game. And it was another fantastic first-person Metroid release. 2004 also brought us Metroid Zero Mission, another Game Boy Advance double shot for 2004. And here's the thing about Zero Mission, you guys. It's a remake of the original Metroid, the original NES Metroid game, which I think is so cool. Also remade in that 16-bit Super Metroid graphic style. Again, Game Boy Advance, insanely popular uh, console. So very smart to have another game to release on that console. And this is, it's a little divisive for me to say this, but believe it or not, I think it's still my favorite 2D Metroid experience. Now it's very short, it's very easy, but I think it's such a succinct, focused, fun 2D Metroid experience. I actually like the general visual style and color palette of this game more so than Super Metroid or Metroid Fusion. I also love the additional Zero Suit section added on to the end of Zero Mission that was not part of the original NES game, of course. That kind of delved a little bit deeper into the Chozo lore. It's more of a stealth mission and not an action mission, but it's a great addition that kind of brings the original Metroid story more in line with what Nintendo and Retro were doing with the Metroid Prime series at the time. And so I think Zero Mission is just simply fantastic. Now the very following year in 2005, they also released Metroid Prime Pinball on the Nintendo DS. What a weird, random, spin-off title. This is the only time they ever tried something this strange for Metroid. Really, for almost any franchise. 
but it's exactly what it sounds like. It was a two-screen pinball retelling of the original Metroid game. It also introduced the Rumble Pack that was a Game Boy Advance cartridge. You would slide into the, to the Game Boy Ad Advance slot on your DS to give that pinball kind of tilt-shake function. And it was just a really fun, quirky, weird little spin-off Metroid game where the pinball was actually Samus in her Morph Ball, and you essentially play through all of Metroid Prime, but in pinball form. It was a ton of fun. I own a copy. I had to repurchase it because I couldn't find my original one. And I love this game. It's not mind-blowing. It's just a real fun, quirky little thing they did. And this was another Metroid game that released in 2005. Now, in 2006 comes a very interesting title, which was Metroid Prime Hunters, also released for the DS. So two years in a row, we got a Nintendo DS Metroid title. This time, they managed to find a way to make first-person Metroid Prime gameplay work on the Nintendo DS. And it works really well. The controls are a little awkward. It's better to use the touch screen for your aiming, but it's also a little bit trickier because you've got to rely on using the stylus to do so. But the controls do work. And the overall design of the game and the multiple planets and locations, it introduced all the different hunters. Psylux obviously playing a big part in the Metroid lore nowadays and is playing a huge part in Metroid Prime 4. Psylux and all of these other hunters were introduced in Metroid Prime Hunters. So it was a fantastic translation of the first person 3D gameplay to a portable using two screens, touchscreen motion gameplay, and introducing a character that would outlast every other character basically in the Metroid franchise and become a part of the now future Metroid Prime 4. This is a really great fun game that is still fun to play today. And then the following year again in 2007, came Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, the first Metroid game released on the brand new motion-controlled Nintendo Wii. I was so freaking excited for this game. I remembered picking it up day one at midnight, and I loved this game. For a time, it was my second favorite Metroid Prime game. Nowadays, it's not. I actually do prefer Echoes to Corruption. However, Corruption is fantastic. It brought in the multiple planets. It brought in the motion gameplay. It went back to weapon stacking as opposed to changing your weapons. The graphics and the bloom lighting were amazing. It did give us other NPC fellow bounty hunters that worked for the Galactic Federation alongside of Samus. The idea of her getting corrupted by Phazon brought a very intimate personal story to Samus's character and something I've constantly called out as an integral part to that game that not a lot of people focus on. And other than being really easy, I still think this is also an almost perfect Metroid game. So for several years in a row, we get a Metroid game and it culminates with Metroid Prime 3 Corruption in 2007 on the Wii. Now we skip ahead two years to 2009 and the most incredible thing happened, possibly my favorite singular video game release in history, is the Metroid Prime Trilogy on the Nintendo Wii, where they took, in my opinion, three of the best games, which includes my favorite game ever, compiled it into one release, and they added the amazing Wii motion controls to Metroid Primes 1 and 2, and they packaged all three games together on one singular disc in a beautiful steelbook case that I still own and play on to this day. And there's not much more to say about this. It was just a great fan service kind of goodwill release by Nintendo and Retro to say, what if we package these three incredible Metroid games all together on one disc for one standard $50 price? We're going to enhance the controls on the first two games. And here you go, world. Here you go, Metroid fans. The Metroid Prime Trilogy. Absolutely mind-blowing. I still own and play it today. And of course, this brings us to the final release, everyone's favorite, not at all controversial Metroid game, which is Metroid Other M, released in 2010 for the Nintendo Wii. And what more do I say about this, you guys? If you know me, you already know my stance on this game. Look, I'm a fan of Metroid Other M. A lot of people are not fans. Some people passionately hate this game. And it breaks my heart because I do think the game is way better than the haters say. I've also gone on record saying it's not a perfect game, and I've acknowledged some of the flaws. It's definitely lower on my list of Metroid games, but in its own bubble, 
as a regular action game released on the Wii, and even as a Metroid game, with an interesting exploration of Samus and a really interesting story that fits into the larger universe in a very fun way. Despite some of its flawed and weird decisions, it's a great game, it's a great Metroid game. Now, I do understand why some people don't like it, of course. The only thing I'll say is I think that the passionate haters are the ones I don't understand. Those with normal criticisms or who are willing to say, look, it's just not a game that works for me, and these are the reasons I don't like it, I understand that. Rational criticism makes sense. The over-the-top haters, I just don't see what you feel. I, I don't understand it. But at the end of the day, everyone's opinion is their own. And also, look, when we're exploring the 2000s for the golden age prolific era of Metroid, we can't leave out this release. It was a huge, highly publicized, highly marketed release. It is one of the most unique singular releases in the franchise, so it also holds that distinction. It gave Samus a full voice throughout that whole game, whether you like or dislike how they did it. The fact that it exists makes it unique. They've never tried that before or since. Even Metroid Dread's two lines of dialogues from Samus is not the same as what they did in Other M. And so, as a fan of Metroid and a fan of Other M, I'm proud to say that this amazing decade of Metroid ended with Other M. And so, this is something I've wanted to do for a long time for you guys, my audience, and my viewers, and my fellow Metroid fans, anyone who tunes into me for my Metroid conversations. I've been thinking about this for a while. One of these days, I need to really explore and just break down and go game by game this incredible era of the 2000s where Nintendo was just on fire with the Metroid franchise. Really surprising, too, when you think about it, because we all know that Metroid is a franchise known for extremely high quality, not the strongest sales. So what was Nintendo smoking and snorting in the 2000s that they were like, here you go, Metroid games for everybody. You get a Metroid game and you get a Metroid game. Nine games over the course of essentially 10 years? That's crazy. We are so lucky, especially those of us who lived through it. I was in my 20s that entire time. So I got to really, as an adult, experience and appreciate all these games. What a great time to be a Metroid fan that was. Then we went through, of course, the dark period where after Other M, we just got Federation Force, another very divisive, strange game in 2016, until we hit 2017, where we got Samus Returns, a great remake of uh, Metroid 2 on the Nintendo 3DS, and the announcement of Metroid Prime 4. So the double dose in 2017 was a little bit different. We did get a great game that released, we got the announcement of a very exciting game, but we know the story and the tragic tale of Metroid Prime 4. No need revisiting that, especially because now we're in the era where we've finally seen the frickin' game and we know it's somewhere in the foreseeable future for us to play. And a small little game called Metroid Dread released in 2021, Metroid Prime Remastered came out last year in 2023. So we're kind of entering what I feel like is probably a new golden age for Metroid and I have discussed that on a video in the past. But more than anything, I wanted to take us back to the 2000s, man, and just remind ourselves that there was that period. And the brilliance of that period is nowadays, we can go back and play and experience all those games. Most of them, well, maybe not most, but a lot of them are available on the Nintendo Switch uh, expansion pack online thing, the Nintendo Switch online service. You can play the Game Boy games and the Super Nintendo games and or the, the Super Nintendo game, let me say, and the NES game. So you can play a lot of these uh, via NSO nowadays, which I think is certainly very cool. I'm somebody who just already owns these games anyway. I own the physical copies. I also own um, all the 2D games on top of just having them. I also have them on my Wii U downloaded. So I don't even need to play them on my Switch. I can play them on my Wii U. So it's great to go back and revisit these games. I recommend you do so if you haven't in a very long time, or if you've never played them. And so, I'm going to put a bow on this. This was a lot of fun, something I was looking forward to do for a while. And like I said, now, we just get to wait for Metroid Prime 4 Beyond, whenever we get to see that again, which I personally think will happen before the end of 2024. Fingers crossed. Once again, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you for watching, guys, and I will see you next time on another video.